both going to talk about a few things about identity and access management. So the topic of today is know your hiring landscape. Um, before going to speak to that, I will give a brief introduction about the company that I'm working for. Uh, Tech Democracy is a cyber body form. It was founded in the year 2000. And for the past 22 years, Tech Democracy has been delivering identity and access management solutions as well as identity governance solutions to hundreds of the clients in the uh, US. Um, and uh, we are also in recently ventured into cyber advisory, uh, risk assessment, and uh, security services as well. Um, and um, we, we are global. That means we have offices, our Canadian offices in Mississauga, Ontario, and uh, our head office is in um, um, Princeton, New Jersey, and we are also in the uh, APAC region. We go by the name of Integrity Media Private Limited, working operating from Hyderabad. We uh, have more than 300 global talent workforce, and um, um, you can see some of the awards and recognition that democracy has done over the years. Um, and uh, uh, our repeat customers come brand new to the right away. So, again, a uh, brief history. So, starting, starting with 2000, fast forward to 2022, we have opened our Canadian um, operations uh, from Mississauga, but our workforce are remote, and uh, we have, um, we have, um, we have colleagues working from almost every province of Canada. So we are trying to expand more into the Western Canada. And uh, some of the services that we provide here, as you can see, um, identity and access management, risk, as well as um, um, threat management and so on. So we are vendor agnostic. We work with a wide range of partners. Um, you can recognize all these names here yeah, if you're a security guard, I am, and uh, we are really happy to collaborate with one such preferred vendor partner, we are trust. These are the three values that we try to bring to all of our implementations and projects. Okay. I wanted to start with a Halloween joke, but they say great minds think alike, and Ed, who worked on this presentation independently, wanted to use the same joke, so I'm going to skip that and keep the suspense until the end, okay? We keep it safe. All right, I think I did a good job. All right, let me, uh, so Ed, I didn't steal your joke, it's still yours. Okay. <laughs> okay, so identity and access management, that's the topic I'm going to talk about. Um, I will give an introduction about myself. I'm a senior manager at Tech Democracy, and I have been working in the identity and access management sphere for the, more than 15 years from now. Um, so uh, I started in uh, early 2000s, where um, I used to work in the US. I, mean, I, I was working with Tech Democracy at the time. And whenever, uh, whenever I went and introduced myself as an identity and access management consultant, people often confused me as an MBA because identity management was not so well known those times. And it was just LDAP, or uh, at the most, an access manager, uh, identity manager, very benign, very innocent days up there. Okay, so I'll just talk about the what to and why of the identity management. Just an introduction. So, what is identity management? Identity management is a combination of two areas. One is identity management, as, as the name goes, and the other one is access management. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about each of these in the next few slides. So why do we need identity and access management? As you know, the, the top reason for any security breach is unauthorized access of some sorts, right? People, hackers gain unauthorized access and then they escalate the privileges. Um, and that's how, that, that, that's the main reason for uh, security breaches for years. So how to control the unauthorized access and how to, how to make sure that all the access that's there, that's assigned is accountable. Identity management can help us with that, how 
identity management ensures that right people can gain right access at right times to right resources for the right reasons. So, so that means people who are who should be allowed to access a resource should be given the access, and those who should not be given access should be blocked or denied the access. And identity management can take it, can take care of this um, automatically. And who needs identity management? Anybody, anyone who wants to control access to their uh, um, assets, assets or uh, information that they want to protect. So if you have something that you want to protect and control access, you need identity management. So today we are going to talk about identity management purely from a user perspective. So there are different kind of, kinds of identities, but I'm going to focus only on the user identity um, aspect of identity management. So to, uh, since it's a very vast area, we have chosen three focus areas. One is identity management, the second one is access management, and the third one is privileged access management. I'll be talking about the first two, and Ed will be talking about the third one. So identity management. Identity management, what is it? Managing identity. Then what is an identity? An identity is a collection of characteristics or attributes, we say, that can uniquely identify an entity in an organization. So you have so many users, you have so many entities in an organization. How can you uniquely identify the characteristics? Let's say, uh, what's your name? Jojo. Jojo. Yes. So you are Jojo. How do you describe yourself? Who is Jojo? <laughs> when I say Jojo, what should I think? I should think of the beautiful hair that Jojo has. I should think of like her earrings, some characteristics, right? Or if I know you very well, the way you talk, the languages you speak, or your likes and dislikes. So the characteristics are unique for you, and they make sure that you are Jojo. Can anybody else be Jojo? They can imitate you, but they cannot be. So that's identity. It's unique. It's single within the whole organization. Okay. Then identity management deals with the life cycle of these identities. What is life cycle? Life cycle means you start somewhere, you go somewhere else, and ultimately that's finished or done. So similarly for identity, um, I call it, I, I took three stages, you can give any names you want, but I call it as onboarding. That means bringing in identity into the organization. Let's say we create, and there is a need for an identity to be created in, a, in an organization. Then what should happen as the next step? Identity is created, there are many systems, then we have to make sure that this identity is propagated to all the systems the identity is supposed to have an account or an entity, right? So that's the onboarding. Identity management can do that. So once you bring in an identity, you can have, um, depending on the characteristics of that identity, it can be created on multiple systems at once without manual intervention. So then, okay, we have the identity there, then something needs to be changed. That person got promoted or got transferred to another department or left the company, or uh, went on mad leave, right? So then some, a few things should be changed, right? The account status, for example, active, active, or if uh, it's a transfer from one department to another, the job code changes, and so does the responsibilities. So modification of identity in one system, when done, should be done on other relevant systems. So there should not be uh, what we call as fragmented identity. Like you have certain characteristics for this identity. Like Jojo uh, is somebody here in uh, Bo Valley College, and suddenly Jojo changes into somebody else at her home. Is that possible? No, Jojo should be Jojo anyway. So similarly, that identity change should be transported to all other systems. Um, <clears throat> so those modifications are also handled by identity and access manager. Um, underlying technology is like there are some few things called connectors that connect uh, one system to other systems. Changes are triggered, changes trigger events, and then those changes are propagated. 
So finally, the deactivation, very important. So what happens when somebody leaves the company and the accounts are only canceled on one system? Unauthorized access or incomplete deactivation, orphaned accounts, a big problem for security. So deactivated accounts should be taken care of so that if an account is no longer needed, the status should reflect in all other, in all systems in a unified way. So that's taken care of by identity management. Um, another important feature is the user self-service um, password resets. So somebody forget the password instead of calling a help desk, click on the password reset link, um, get an OTP or answer a few questions and get your password reset. Save operational costs as well as increase the process efficiency. So this is also done by the identity and access, uh, identity management. So profile changes like we talked about modifications. Um, Modifications can be two types. One is admin made, and the other one is user made. So certain attributes users can change. Say like telephone number. You got a new cell phone, or uh, you wanted to change your number, then you can do it by yourself. Or whatever is permitted by your organization for you to modify by yourself. So these are the two things. One is the lifecycle management, the other one is the self-service changes. So um, let's say you have IDM in place, then how to make sure you have your IDM is right. So this is not a complete list of checks, but a few important pointers to know. Um, so if you have an identity and access management system in your organization, then check whether that identity system is delivering a single and unique identity. So this is the whole goal of identity management. No fragmented identity, no duplicated identity, single, unique, uniform identity across all the systems. So if that's the if that's what is being delivered by your identity management, then you are getting it right. And there is a centralized repository. So a centralized data store, be it LDAP data, a simple .csv file or a database, whatever it is, you have a centralized area where all your identities are stored and a cha any change made on one of the systems is first brought to this centralized repository. Okay, so it pulls the changes and then it pushes the changes to other systems, relevant systems again. So if you have a centralized repository, uh, or else how will you how will you manage? Like each system should be connected to like let's say you have n number of systems. One system should be connected to n minus one. So many connectors, right, for each, and that's very difficult to maintain. So one centralized repository, bring in the changes, push the changes to other systems, and auditing and logging. Everybody agrees how knows how important it is, right? Yeah. So <coughs> to analyze um, what's going on with your system or to act as um, uh, evidence if something goes wrong. Okay. The second part, access management. So who can access what? That's what access management does. So it can dictate who can access what resources and it can also um, track those accesses. Okay, so that's access management. Letting good people in, blocking bad people from accessing the system. Um, access management has some function, has, has a, a few functionalities and today I will talk about authentication authorization. So access management, when I'm saying it can manage who can access what, how is it doing? It does it by the help of policies, access policies, certain rules are put in place. Those rules combine together, become a policy. Then the policy determines if a certain user can access a system or cannot access a system. So uh, those, there are two kinds of policies. One is authentication policy and the other one is authorization policy. What's the difference between those two? Authentication will let the system know who you are, who you claim to be. And uh, authorization will tell you what you can access. So if you take a real life example, uh, as a Canadian citizen, you want to travel to a foreign country, let's say. What two, What are the two official documents that you need to carry? One is your password, it's right? And the other one is the visa, right? The visa that you need to enter the other country. So authentication is your passport, authentication document. So it verifies who you are, whether you are a Canadian citizen, you are Jojo, 
and you look like uh, this, or you are age so and so. So everything. So it establishes your identity, what who you are. And then what is visa? It is permission to stay in a foreign country for a given time period, right? So that's the difference between authentication and authorization. Um, another beneficial feature of access management is single sign-on. So log in once and access multiple times. Reduces password fatigue and again improves the user experience. Um, <clears throat> so single sign-on. There is another form of single sign on federation. I want to talk about the difference between these two. So if you have an organization, let's say you have multiple applications, you log into application one, then you want to access application number two without having to resubmit your credentials. So the process behind that is the single sign on going on. So there's a token generated for all technical stuff, but that's you log in once, you access and, uh, multiple times. So then federation. Federation facilitates the same thing, single sign-on, but between different organizations. So um, let's say you are uh, you are working for your company, and your company provides some um, healthcare benefits. Let's say like they have uh, a health insurance from all the Blue Cross, for example. Then you log into your company's portal, and you want to verify your benefits, okay, health benefits um, or insurance benefits. Then you just click on the link for Alberta Blue Cross and you are into Alberta Blue Cross's um, your member portal without having to submit Alberta Blue Cross login credentials. So you log in with your company credentials, but you are able to access the other company's um, portal hub. So that's federation is the uh, mechanism behind that. So one within one organization, whether one domain or many domains, it's single sign-on. Between various organizations, it's federation. Similarly, um, like we did with identity management, how do you know that your AM is right? So your access policy should not be static. They should be based on zero trust. Never trust, always verify. Yeah. So, um, so your access policies are risk-based. Depending on the risk uh, that application has, your policy authentication, can step up or step down. So um, these are called adaptive access policies. So if your application is, a, so say like, you, again, you access application one, you click on number two, application number two, then that's a high risk application. Then your authentication will step up, means it needs more uh, proof that you are who you are. So you will either be prompted for a multi-factor um, authentication like another token, or you might be asked to re-log in or uh, if you are not eligible to access, you will be denied access. So depending on the high risk, uh, the risk level, your authentication policies will change uh, or adapt. So this this is like if your AM is if your access management is doing that, then it's going in the right direction. Other one is the continuous access certification verification of who has access to what. So you granted access to certain users, let's say. Um, uh, um, I'm not stepping into your area, but <laughs> um, you gave certain admin privileges to some accounts, right? some some users or some employees in your company. Uh, in olden days, you just used to give them escalated privileges, make everybody EBA, let them have fun. <laughs> Yay! Then what happens at 2 a.m. in the night? You get phone call. Hey, the website is down. We are healthcare company. 99% uptime is needed. It's all IAM's fault. It's all identity management's fault. It's not something is not working. So everybody, sorry, that's my phone. So that that's not that's not recommended anymore. What you do is you give access, and periodically you verify the access that you have given. So a document is made, a report is made that will be sent to. Whoever is responsible for verifying the access, a supervisor or an administrator, and uh, they will verify the access. And if it's not needed, it will be revoked. So continuous access certification should be done. You should not provide access once and blindly trust. And of course, auditing and logging should be made. So if your access management has these qualities, then, then it's, it's going in the right direction. So that's all you have for me today. 
Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for not stealing my curtain. We got one coming up here in a few slides. Um, I'm Ed McKenzie. I'm from Beyond Trust. I'm uh, a sales guy. So don't be afraid. I'm just you know, here to, to, to pass through you. Um, I've been asked graciously by, by Tech Democracy to talk about privileged access management. So we heard what identities are. How do I identify who a person is? And then I talked about what, what access should that identity have? The last step is privileged access. And that's what we're here today to talk about, um, is what is that privileged access? Right now in the industry, um, of course, the one I want to talk to is got this little duty box on top of it. Um, there's a lot of moving parts in the industry. And, and I had a conversation with somebody earlier in the booth today. That's fine, don't worry about it. Um, what's driving one of my conversations with my customers is cyber insurance. Um, there are some requirements in the cyber insurance industry now that they're requiring people to have PAMs in place, point blank. They're saying in order for us to renew your policy, you have to have a PAM. You have to sign that pass, have test station letter to say you have done this. Um, so we are seeing a big uptick in this, and the reason is, is a bunch of companies went into the cyber insurance business 10 or 15 years ago, and they've had to begin writing checks against those policies. Because hackers, we're all in this together. It's not a matter of when, uh, or sorry, if, it's a matter of when they're gonna be hit. It is gonna happen. Everybody's gonna be hit. So these guys are now beginning to write their checks to them. So what they're demanding on their customers now you have to have a pen in place. The other one is compliance. Joe Biden last year, main time frame, through the Transportation and Safety Administration, issued a directive to all fuel based pipelines in North America. If you have a pipeline that goes through the United States of America, you will be protected with a privilege management solution that blacklists or whitelists software. Why? Because Colonial Pipeline last year was hacked was taken down and the price of gasoline at the pump in Washington, D.C. was five times the normal price. The pipeline, the fuel-based pipeline in North America has been identified as an issue is critical infrastructure. Just like the electrical grid is, just like the water grid is. Um, the fuel-based pipeline has been identified. So they have to put it in place. The other one that's driving a lot of, of um, discussions is is around IT efficiency and automation and um, um, assessments that are done in the environment. I'd say half of the conversations I'm having with people, I start off with, why are we here? Why are we talking? What's the compelling event that made you reach out? And a lot of it is, hey, my cyber insurance company said I must, or Joe Biden said I must, or a healthcare industry, HIPAA as a regulation in place that I must. The other half of the conversations I'm having is, I've realized I'm at risk, my company is at risk. I've had a risk assessment that we're at 2.0 on a scale of five, that's not good enough. I don't want to be at five, I want to get something better than two. So assessments and getting my IT staff more efficient at protecting us is what he's driving. I've got one customer I won't name them who had a missed assessment done. They put a program in place that create, had 14 projects underneath it to address the fact that their NIST assessment came in at 2.2, which is unacceptable. If they wanted to be at three, they gave themselves three years to do. So they didn't remeasure themselves in 2023 and see if the 14 projects that they kickstarted in 2020 have moved the needle up to 3.0. Those are the conversations that are driving why PAM exists. So again, it's a subset underneath as Hyman said, the, the IAM industry. So IAM is the big overall, access is it, and then focus down on privileged access. What do I mean by privilege? That could be Windows administrators, Active Directory administrators, SQL administrators, Cisco administration, uh, Unix, Linux administration. All of those have an inherent privilege that comes along with those accounts. And we help manage those accounts. I love asking the question. I asked it this morning. Another gentleman in the booth said, How do you manage privileges? He goes, You don't want to know. I said, Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> he said, He said, Well, it's, it's in a spreadsheet. I said, That's good. Okay, so I can get to it. 
It's encrypted. Oh, that's great. And it's on a SharePoint. Great. Yeah. Control who has access to the SharePoint. Control who has access to the spreadsheet. Do you understand the encryption level on a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet is not that hard to crack? Probably a 14 year old kid knows how it breaks into the crack. So your privileges are in a slot. Your, your usernames and passwords are in a slot that just about anybody can grab onto. And more importantly, take it away. Right? So not just have access to it, take a copy of it and run away. So I love asking the question how are you protecting your privileges? One customer, again, I will never be a customer publicly. Um, the conversation started off with, uh, with Ed, we need some help. Why? We had a pen test done. We held off for two hours. The pen. We were out there trying to get in. We held them open, the network. But then as part of the pen test, if you're not familiar, you got to let them in. you got to pretend they breached. He goes, we did five minutes of letting them in. They have complete control of the environment. I said, why is that? It was because there are many username and passwords that sit in the process. So give me one username. Admin and I got into all the locks. It's all of the windows to our within five minutes. So understanding what your privileges are, because they're everywhere now. That's that's probably the most important thing in understanding is your privileges are everywhere. Don't just think of them as, as the typical um, IT administrator. They're everywhere. They're on your local laptops. Some, some people have stripped them. We'll, we'll see here in a second. Some people have stripped those and pin rights away. Others haven't. But privileges now exist everywhere. And I had another conversation with a gentleman. Where is it? IoT. This is scary. Um, there's some nasty stuff happening, and I, and I won't go down the one path. Uh, pretty disturbing video that's up there where, where somebody took remote control of a camera in a nursery in a house. And the baby, that toddler was waking up in the middle of the night screaming. You know, somebody had hacked into an IoT device in the house and allowed them access to the camera. Not only that, the camera has a speaker. This gentleman was speaking through the camera to the kid that was in there. So there's some nasty stuff happening with IoT as we enable everything with the internet. So your bad actors, as I'm going to call them, are after this. These are the things we need. Or we help you protect from, from beyond trust is privileges, whether it's a password, a credential, a secret, etc. Secrets nothing more than a, a simple way of saying, oops, uh oh. I don't have my glass on. I don't know where's the backspace key. Let's try that one. There we go. Um, so Pam, people ask, help me understand what it is. Here's what it is in a nutshell. It's really made up of a few domains, and this is taken from Gardner. I created this slide. Okay, I'm going to play you guys from there. So, password, privileged account and session management. So, what is a privileged account? A Windows admin, an AD admin, a Linux root, a Cisco admin. Any of those are, are privileged accounts. I'm going to help you control them. How, how I help you control them or, or any PASM should help you control them is. Discover on the network where these privileges are. And we have some tools that can help you discover where those privileges are. Once I've got them, put them up in a safe. I not, might not need to onboard all of them. I may say, you know what, my Linux boxes don't care. My Windows, yeah, I'm going to bring them up first. Now that I've got them up in a safe, I'm going to control who has access to it. So I'm going to manage who gets access into the safe. So imagine I get to walk into the bank and I get to go into the safe. So yes, that's allowed me into the safe. Am I allowed to open up any safety deposit box? No. Based upon my role, I get to open up certain safety deposit boxes. Imagine those are systems. So now Ed logs into the safe, and we say Ed's allowed to gain access to a certain subset of systems. That's great. What's Ed doing? So what I do is I ask the safe, create me a session down to this box. It creates me the session and begins recording absolutely all the video keystrokes and months. So this is what we need in, in the sense of housing is a privileged account and session management is I'm going to allow you access to a privilege, not just access, but a privilege access. And I'm going to record everything that you do. The other half of the house is PET, privilege delegation and delegation management. And, and I tell everybody this story, and I apologize if you're in the booth and I already told you. Now, when I started with Beyond Trust, they sent me the burger laptop and I opened it up for a little kid. Turn it on, and there's two pieces of software I need to load to do my job. 
I was hired during the pandemic time, so the very first one was a set of headset for software. And so you double click on the Polycom install. And what do you think happens? That's a Beyond Trust laptop. We drink our own champagne. So the Beyond Trust product stepped in. Go, wait a minute, you're a sales guy. You're the lowest level trust in the company. So we're not going to allow you to load this software. But there's a box on it. It says, however, if you think you really need this software, push this button. And I did, is it Microsoft Teams needs to talk to my headset or control my headset. Yes, I can still connect it to Bluetooth, but you don't get the automation. So I hit the button. It takes all the information about that piece of software from Polygon and sends it into ServiceNow. and automatically creates a ticket in ServiceNow and sends it off to the security analyst. Security analyst in about 10 to 15 minutes looked at it and paid me back on Teams saying, hey, I can see you're trying to load this, we're okay with that. Give me the code. I give him a code that's displayed on my screen. He gives me an eight-digit code. I type it in, and my process, my process on my Windows machine is elevated to install the software and then be elevated. Period. No more, no less. I might give it an end user name or password. I am elevated for the amount of time I need it and then be elevated immediately thereafter. Guess what happens 30 days? Well, he goes, hey, there's an update. What do I do on the squirrel chaser? I double click on it. I have to have something right I double click it, what happens? The one trust steps in again and goes, no answer, you're not allowed. So I go through the whole cycle again and I get the update. 30 days later, same thing happens, I double click it, go through the whole process again. We have an internal policy at Beyond Trust within our, our services team that says after three events, you will contact me. So they contact me going, are you going to do this? I said, yes, of course I am. Every 30 days I'm going to say I want to do the result. So they whitelist it. The next 30 day cycle comes up, I double click on it, what happens? It just installs. I don't even, I don't have to touch anything, it installs. The second piece of software that I loaded on my first day was Spotify, because I listened to music in my home office. Um, what do you think happened when I double click on Spotify, WDX, Spotify, whatever it is? Any guesses? It installed. Why? Somebody at Beyond Trust. Said, you know what? We're going to let all our people who load Spotify if they want. So they put it in the whitelist. Now, not that my sons would do this, because they already have all their own technology, but my son takes a laptop and he tries to load Minecraft. What do you think happened? Stop. The big red sign comes up and it's blacklisted. It's not allowed. Our team looked at it and said, no, we're never going to allow you to know. Go away, go do real work. So Pam was all about elevating somebody when they need it, just in time and get it done. Do not stop them from doing work. If I actually had that low flex user for a developer, they would quit. A developer would not work in that environment. Why? Because Visual Studio requires privileges. If you're going to give the admin username and password to a developer, you just opened a huge risk. Why? What? And I don't mean to offend anybody. Users are stupid. They will click on things that they're not supposed to click on. I have been personally um, uh, um, hit by ransomware, encrypted my entire disk of 35,000 folders. Luckily, I'm smart enough and I had a backup, so I didn't have to pay anybody any ransom. But I was personally hit because I was looking for a border for a, a picture, and it was ransomware. Ransomware can only do damage if it has um, um, privilege. And this is what helps stop it. Just take the privilege away. Don't allow users to have privilege. Don't give them the admin user name. Don't make it easy. Protect the company. The number one thing, if you look at, at Gardner's report um, for cybersecurity, state of cybersecurity in 2022, is ransomware is the number one target and will continue to be number one target. So we need to protect against that. So back to housing. Just discover where your privileges are. Store them up in a safe place, manage who has access to them, and then monitor and record everything they do with, the, with that access. Pretty straightforward. If you do that, you've just lowered your risk in your company because that is a major attack vector for bad actors to get in. Give me a privilege, I'm going to do damage. Make it the same privilege on multiple machines, I'm going to even do more damage. The worst thing I can ever hear is, yeah, we use the same username and password across the entire at least randomize it, change it. Make it a little bit difficult for the person. Now, 
This is back to the penal one for a second. Taking away the least privilege, stripping away the admin rights from your local laptop. Why do you need admin rights? You don't if it's a corporate machine. I just want to bring your attention to this. The easiest thing to do is strip away admin rights and just reduce the opportunity for ransomware. This lady is a, uh, a speaker of ours uh, that we use. She's an ethical hacker. Her and our CSO, go look up Mark Maker. Uh, if you want to read a giggle, Mark woke up one Sunday morning with the FBI at his door with guns drawn uh, because Mark was an ethical hacker. And he had hacked into a government website, and they didn't like that idea. So they came and paid him a visit on uh, a Sunday morning. But both Mark and Paula are ethical hackers trying to expose where the weaknesses in the world exist. So why, and we're coming to behind this uh, part two again, why is privilege and, and at the user level of that thing? We all know we have antiviruses, right? And you do a good job. I came from academia before. They're required, you need them. Why? Because they hit no one now. They can get rid of the, the stuff we already know about. What they can do, they're useless against zero day. Cannot do a thing against zero day. Who does a great job against zero day? The EDRs, cyber or crowd strikes of the world. Do a great job of helping you understand something's happening on your system, on your network, that isn't the way it used to be yesterday. So it really helps you understand what's happening there. And then, of course, you take some of this information from all these different systems you can have down here at an EDR level. And push them up maybe to a sim, right? And let your sim look at all the data and try to make heads or tails of the sim. Okay, that's great. Have some antivirus, a cyber tool. Have an EDR, a cyber tool. Have a sim, a cyber tool. Man, if I just stripped away admin rights to begin with, you know how much noise you wouldn't come down the street? Ransomware. Requires privileges to do any amount of damage. Any amount of damage. The reason they encrypted my disk is my username on my home machine is an administrator. So they've got complete control of my C drive, my D drive, and my D drive. Everything that was a doc, a JPEG, everything, they encrypted every single one of them and then put the splash screen up asking for a Bitcoin. And this was probably a decade ago. Now I can tell you I'm a lot smarter than what I expect nowadays. But it was my own fault, admittedly, and that's why I mean users are stupid. We love clicking things. Oops, I was going over the best part. Mm -hmm. So how do you scare a CISO when you talk about admin rights? Just tell them everybody's got admin access. That would scare the living heck out of me. If you told me every laptop in Beyond Trust has admin rights, that's just a recipe for disaster. And it's such an easy fix. So when I talk to people about this, is they've either gone one end of the spectrum or the other. Everybody's got admin rights, or nobody's got admin rights. What's the bad thing to nobody having it? It's a pain in the butt for any developer. Why? Because Visual Studio requires privilege to run. The reason it requires privilege to run is because it wants to write into the C drive, and sometimes it wants to write into the register. So why not elevate that user, that, that Visual Studio process on demand? rather than giving that developer the admin machine. So, head them, least privilege, whatever you want to call that, is all about taking away the admin rights and letting the CISO sleep at night. My last slide and my last statement. So, everything I've talked about is not beyond trust. I've got competitors, I'm not going to name them, I don't want to give them the time of day. But we all do the same thing, whether it's PASM, Petal or a combination of the two, remote access into your environment, etc. It doesn't matter where on your journey of beginning to manage your privileges you start, but once, once as Heine talked about, once we've identified who you are, and we identify the access you're allowed, and we identify what privileges, because privilege is where damage occurs. Identity and access is where data is stolen from. But privileges were damage. I have to have privilege to exfiltrate the data at a global scale. I can, I can seal stuff off of my laptop and have fun. 
take my Beyondtrust laptop, there's no information. Right? If give me a privilege on a on a SQL database, on an Oracle database, I'm gonna get it. Right? So my point on this one, there's no rights clock to start. I've had conversations with customers going, ahead. it's such a big task. And it's like, no, it's not. Help me understand what you think the problems are that you're running into. If you don't know, I can help and say, here's challenges other customers have. You have the same challenges, et cetera. But there's no right place or wrong place. If you decide to start with, with secure your, your privileged account that house on the side of the house, that's a great place to start. Let's put all my passwords up in one spot, control who's got access, record every time it's used. How many people have to sign off? Every 90 days for publicly traded companies, CFOs have to sign off on what? Sarbanes Oxley. What is one of the requirements of the Sarbanes Oxley Act that that CFO is signing off on? That I know who had access to the financial control systems of this company. I can actually help you understand who actually had access. Because I log it all. I actually help customers pass their IT audits way faster than they ever could before. Or if you decide to jump on with, with least privilege, what I just talked about, it doesn't matter, get on board. And the customers that, that, that are getting on board are beginning to, to go back on the side, they're not scared of anything. I'd be happy to stand up a year from now and say that my customer who had their risk assessment, 2.3, 2. Um, is greater than three next year. Because they're taking a proactive approach, understanding there is risk, there is gaps in their security um, posture. You know, if, if you can hire anybody, hire an outside consultant who can help you take a look at your environment and show you your gaps. And you may have these covered. I'm not saying you, you don't. But pay attention to those gaps and see where you can reduce your risk. And, and then I'll shut up. I had one CSO, CISO, who had 15 minutes of fame every 90 days because he got to talk to the board of directors every 90 days. And he walked in with one slide, with one number on the left and one number on the right. One on the left was the last quarter's mark, and the one on the right was this quarter's mark. And what he did is found a way to measure risk within the company on a scale of one to seven. So he walked in and he go, we are a one about 5.7, and today we're at 5.6 or 5.8 or whatever it is. And that's all he did is present to the board and say that. Why? Because he actually understood where all of his risk was in the company. He was able to quantify. Now they go, okay, why did we go up? Well, here's some programs we had in place that are improving our posture. Why did it go down? Well, here's some areas that we're breached or we're having challenges. Understanding your risk is the most important thing you can do. Uh, privileges just help you lower that risk. I would argue Beyond Trust is not a uh, cybersecurity. I would argue we're a privilege management company. You should be managing your privileges whether you're concerned about cyber or not. If you do it properly, then inherently you can show it. Any questions? Because Lord knows I can talk for everybody. And yes, I have to wear these shoes apparently. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can. can too. Um, beyond trust, we were in the sector of the big security conference in Toronto uh, two weeks ago, and there's nine people in the booth all with the same shoes on. It's our marketing gal, she makes us do it. We all fought the uh, t shirts, and you gotta get something like that. And they do come with double A patterns. <coughs> Any questions? Sorry that I can answer. Sorry. NIST, ISO, CIS, CNMI, what do you find a better lever when you have a conversation about people who are trying to measure? Any and all. Any and all. By the attack, it's more operational. Is, is there something that you're finding is, is more granular, more understood, or is it just kind of flavor them up? For it, 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 it truly is flavor them up. My, my point is, and hence that slide, understand there's risk. I don't care how you measure it. Actually, I have one customer I can't again name him. He's got the ISO uh, 27,000 circle. He's on any business in the U.S. Right? He got measured against that. From, from the answer organization. So it really depends upon your organization. I've had people with this, I've had people hire those in tech democracy who come in and go, we're gonna do an assessment of the environment, here's the gaps we see. And, and so yeah, to answer your question, just pick one. It really doesn't matter what right? any other questions I can help with? Otherwise I'll hand it back to Mike. Yeah. I have the same question. Any questions for me? 
Well, thank you for your time.